welcome to the Beyond Barriers podcast. If you're an ambitious woman who wants to dominate your career, then you are in the right place. This podcast is co-hosted by Nikki Barua, digital innovator, serial entrepreneur, author, and speaker. And Monica Marquez, ex-Googler, diversity expert, and senior corporate leader. From inspiring stories to cutting-edge strategies, you'll learn how to develop the skill set, mindset, and tool set to get future ready fast and accelerate your success. Hi, I'm Monica Marquez, your host for today's episode. Can you imagine at the age of 26, taking a $100 birthday gift challenge and turning it into $2 million in order to turn your idea for social change into reality all in just two weeks? Sounds unbelievable, doesn't it? Where would you even begin? Well, meet Carrie Rich, the co-founder and CEO of the Global Good Fund, an organization that accelerates the leadership development of high potential young social entrepreneurs tackling the world's greatest issues. Just eight years after taking on her birthday challenge, Carrie has impacted the lives of more than eight and a half million people around the world. Carrie is also the managing director of the Global Impact Fund, a venture capital fund created in 2016 that invests in social impact companies led by people of color and women. In addition to leading the Global Good Fund, Carrie has served on the faculty at George Washington University, Georgetown University, and at the Amani Institute in Kenya, Brazil, and India. Among her many awards, she was named the 2016 EY Entrepreneur of the Year, Washington Business Journal 40 Under 40, Entrepreneur.com Top 30 Startups to Watch, and is the recipient of the Political Women Who Rule Award, among many more. Visit IamBeyondBarriers.com, where you will find show notes and links to learn more about the Global Good Fund and about their upcoming event, Fund the Good, on December 9th at 5.30 p.m. Eastern. The Fund the Good virtual event will celebrate organizational accomplishments for the year and their entrepreneurs during this challenging 2020. Carrie will be joined by Arlen Hamilton, founder of Backstage Capital, to discuss the role of supporting underrepresented leaders to change the world. Go to imbeyondbarriers.com for links to RSVP or donate to the Fund the Good initiative. Welcome, Carrie. Thank you so much for joining us on the Beyond Barriers podcast. We are thrilled to have you here, especially given your um, area of expertise and just your amazing story and journey and just the drive and motivation that you have shown over the last few years. And honestly, you know, looking at your history, being so young and driven and just bold and brave to do these things at an age where I know when, you know, way back when, I would not have been brave enough to do that. So kudos to you, but let's dive right in and tell us a little bit about your story and what you've learned along your journey and, you know, some of the maybe key lessons you learned as you kind of dove into the space that you're in. Well, thank you for having me. I'm absolutely delighted to be speaking with you today. Um, When I was in graduate school, I wanted to study health administration. Mm Mm-hmm. And uh, I had this list of questions as a student that I would ask anyone who would speak with me because, you know, as a student, you have this opportunity to talk to people that kind of goes away once you become a professional and might be selling something. So (laughs) I had this list of 10 questions. And one of the questions was, who's the the most creative person you know? And I would go, I would go online and try to find people. I would search through LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. Uh, I would talk to people. And one time a woman responded with another person's name and I reached out to this person. Her name was Tama Mm -hmm. and uh, she was an interior designer at a large international architectural firm that happened to design health facilities. And I was going into health administration um, and I said, you know, I'm not learning anything about health care facility design. And I think I need to learn about that. And so I went to Tama, I, I got a meeting with Tama and I liked her so much. I actually asked for a job. And she said, oh, are you an architect? And I said, no. And she said, are you a designer? And I said, no. She said, well, why are you asking me for a job? This is a design firm. And I explained that, uh, first of all, I really admired her and and her work and leadership. And secondly, that I thought I could be a liaison between the design team and the people who made decisions about financially funding these Mm -hmm. Facilities. And that was a, an amazing foray uh, into the workforce because, first of all, you know, I had no design background and the idea that you could 
have this concept in your mind and then a building would result, oh, what a different <laughs> way of thinking. Right. Um, and the other part of it was being kind of the glue or the thing, the thing that sticks ideas and people together. That was my first opportunity to learn about that. And uh, from there, I was still in graduate school working and uh, I had this internship at a local hospital system Mm -hmm. and my mentor left to go be the CEO of another hospital system. And so they gave me the worst jobs in the hospital to do. I was mopping the floors, which is pretty (laughs) gross in a, in a hospital and Uh uh, folding the baby clothes in the maternity ward, pushing the snack cart, um, discharging patients in the wheelchair. And, you know, the best task I got was taking attendance at the meetings because the reason it was so good is that, you know, when you take attendance, everyone has to walk in and introduce themselves to you. And in one meeting, who should walk in but the CEO of this multi-billion dollar healthcare organization? Mm -hmm. You know, everyone sat up a little straighter when the CEO walked in. And um, I had done some homework and found that he had built the healthcare system and infrastructure in Haiti. Mm-hmm. At the same time that he was building this hospital in the U.S. to become a multi-billion dollar health system. And I thought, wow, this is someone who's so good professionally at what he does and also wants to live a life of purpose. Right. I want to learn from him. Mm-hmm. And uh, I didn't know he had 16,000 employees. I didn't know how to you know, get his attention or ask for a meeting. And so I went on LinkedIn mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. found how emails were structured for the company and emailed his assistant and asked for a meeting to talk about living a life of purpose with the CEO. Mm. And I thought, you know, everyone probably asked him to speak about healthcare as a healthcare CEO. So I'm going to ask him to talk about legacy. And we had this phenomenal conversation. And at the end, I just, I didn't want the the conversation to end. And so I asked if he would do a writing project with me, write a book. Uh And he said, sure. And I had no idea how to write a book, what we would write a book about. (laughs) Uh, But he said yes, and um, that turned into a job opportunity. We and a co-author, the three of us, wrote a book for a year, and uh, he would pontificate, and I would come in and structure his thinking. Mm. And he called one day and said, you know, I'm creating this job as a director of vision translation. Are you interested? I said, I don't know anything about eyesight. And he said, no, no, not eyesight, vision, you know, idea, big ideas, and that turned into this amazing job, again, kind of being the glue to bring people together around Mm -hmm. big ideas, and in this case, the future of health. And, you know, that was a case of an amazing CEO investing in sponsoring, mentoring me as a young woman uh, in the corporate workforce. And he invested so much in me that I thought, wow, how privileged am I to get to work for him if we could find other young people like me who work really hard and care about making the world mm-hmm. a better place and pair me with people like him who have a really strong track record of business success and are looking for social mm-hmm. significance and put some targeted capital behind that pairing. It could be such an amazing catalyst for social good. And that's how the Global Good Fund was born, which is where I am today. That is amazing. And tell me, I mean, just thinking about how, you know, you were proactive, you reached out and you said, listen, I'm going to do some of these maybe um, unusual or unique ways of, of approaching him to kind of gain that relationship. But what helped you overcome fears or any limiting beliefs in actually just like doing that? Like, you know, I, it's just, you know, one of these amazing things where, it seems like you just were so courageous, but, you know, did you struggle with any, you know, just doubts or limiting beliefs in that period? I still struggle. I still terrify (laughs) myself, you know? Um, I think uh, I didn't feel like I had anything to lose. Mm. I thought the worst thing that happens is he'll say no. And I kind of expected that. But if I don't ask, the answer is definitely no. Mm. And, I don't know that anyone's ever asked him before. And I think a lot of times we just don't give people the opportunity to say yes. And that Mm -hmm. if we think from the other person's perspective about what matters to them Mm -hmm. and ask an appropriate question, even a no often results in something that's better for both parties. So yes, I'm, I'm scared all the time. Um, But I think 
pushing myself and other people to live their full potential is so fulfilling for me mm-hmm. personally and I think makes the world a better place that I think it's worth taking a chance and trying. And tell me, let's dig in a little bit into that, because when you're making these difficult decisions or taking these risks, even though you say, you know, you are a little scared or you have doubt, um, take us through maybe the technique of how you make that decision and kind of give yourself that courage to just move forward. Well, when the Global Good Fund was born, it's it today a seven-year-old nonprofit organization. But when, when the organization was born, you know, I was uh, being mentored by the CEO of a large health system. And I said, you know, I think I want to go do this startup nonprofit organization. And he said, let me get this straight. You're going to leave, you know, a path forward here with security and stability and a, and a career track to mm-hmm. go create a startup nonprofit organization. I said, yes. And he took out a stack of napkins and had me write down a financial plan, which I had never done before. And He said, I know you have life goals. I know you have ambitions. You need to figure out what that costs so that you have a plan and can fulfill your life dreams while Mm -hmm. going out and taking this chance. Mm -hmm. You know, having that security of thinking through the back end and how the finances Mm -hmm. would be structured, you know, it gave me the freedom because I didn't have financial foundation to fall back on. You know, I, I didn't come from a place where there was just money flowing. It, you know, I had to earn my keep and right. if it didn't work, I was in trouble. And so um, having, it was, it was actually more risky to be uneducated than it was to take a chance. Mm-hmm. And so going through the, f- the financial planning helped me build confidence to try uh, to take risks. And then I think the other reality was you know, a a key for me has been leveraging the credibility of other people. And so Mm -hmm. when we got started building the Global Good Fund, we built a board of advisors and a board of directors who were people who would give me credibility as a 26-year-old leader. Mm -hmm. And I recognized that, you know, I was learning, I'm still learning, and uh, I needed to surround myself with people who had more experience than me and Mm -hmm. that brought different perspectives to the table. Uh, and to be able to surround myself with really smart people with diversity of perspective gave me a chance to add credibility in communities where I didn't walk in the door with it. Mm-hmm. And that's a critical thing in terms of leveraging your community or leveraging your network. Can you share a little bit about that? Because a lot of the clients and a lot of the women we work with, we find that they don't leverage their network or their community the way they should be. And partly because when we ask them why, you know, they say, oh, well, it just feels, you know, selfish or it feels like I'm out to get something or, you know, I, they don't want to ask. But, you know, I don't think they realize how important it is to really, you know, build those relationships, trusting relationships, and then leverage those relationships. How, how do you gain access to influential leaders and how do you leverage those relationships? Well, the first thing I'd say is it takes one person to make a difference. Mm. It's not, I mean, I didn't start with some great network. I think it took one person believing in me to make a difference. And so I Mm -hmm. hope for for folks out there who are listening, you know, you can be that person. Mm. You can be that person and and communicate that I believe in you to one person. That that truly makes the entire difference. And Mm -hmm. um, I had, I found one person who believed in me. Uh, and I asked that one person, uh, would you take a chance on me? And then that turned into two people and three people and more. And mm-hmm. here's what that looked like. Um, I actually went through some really difficult times professionally where mm-hmm. as an emerging young woman who got promotion opportunities, you know, there was a target on my back. And I went through some really difficult situations. And people watched how I behaved navigating through those situations with grace and grit and resilience. And I felt like screaming uh, or yelling, (laughs) but um, what I did was write thoughtful letters and document and be gracious. Mm -hmm. And as a result, the people who witnessed me go through difficult times, which has happened repeatedly, actually stuck with me or got on board. And so what felt and still feels like a terrible time turned into an amazing opportunity for a leadership moment and support. And so people who watched me go through tough situations the first time 
actually became some of my greatest supporters. Uh, example of that, you know, we had people who today are mentors who at the time were on the board of the company where there was challenges going on that mm-hmm. were involving me directly. And they watched me navigate and then hosted an event for the Global Good Fund at their home, invited their peer network to hear my story and started supporting me. And what I didn't realize at the time was that they were testing me in a thoughtful, constructive way. But it started out with maybe a little bit of time or a little bit of money or a little bit of introductions. And when I followed through and delivered, it turned into more and more. And I found that leveraging their credibility was actually fulfilling for them because we shared values. And I believed so much in the mission of what I was doing that yes, I was explicit about asking for things. I was aggressive about asking for things. And I really believed in what I was asking for because I was trying to make the world a better place. I was trying to help other people live their mm-hmm. potential. Who doesn't want to get on board with that? Who doesn't want to be part of that? And I get rejected all the time, but it only takes a few people to say yes to move the needle. That's brilliant. And one important thing you mentioned was that you were asking and you were specific in the ask, you truly believed in your mission. But the most important thing was that you executed on what you promised you were going to deliver. Share some tips on effective execution. Like how did you, you know, what does it take? How did you make sure that you were executing and delivering, you know, over like, you know, basically under promising and over delivering? What is, what is your tactic on that? I think most people, when they think of delivering, think about some big operational execution. Mm -hmm. But what I'm actually talking about is so simple that most people don't do. It's things like following up on introductions. Mm -hmm. Because one of the greatest gifts people can make is an introduction, sharing their network. And you want the right people to connect with. Mm -hmm. And when someone makes an introduction, for example, you know, I follow up immediately and say, thank you. I follow up with the person they introduced me to. We schedule a time for a conversation. We talk. I thank that person, and I also thank the person who made the introduction and let them know how the conversation went. And for the future, when I do have a touch base with the person they introduced me to, I let the other person know and say thank you. And as your network grows, it becomes Mm time-consuming, but it makes people want to continue to introduce folks to me. Mm -hmm. Uh, And that's what's happened in terms of growing my own network. And I think so often... We think of execution and follow through as this big operational, t- an event or right. you know, a report. And the reality is those are important. But the reason people keep helping build your network is because you're gracious and appreciative and follow through on introductions made. Say thank you and let them know how the conversation went. So they want to do more of that. That's that's really great and tangible advice. And wanting to dig a little bit more in terms of, you know, you have been extremely successful and have, you know, a lot of career success. And what we usually tell people, you know, when they're wanting to be successful themselves is say, identify people who are successful and do what they do. So why don't you give us some insights on your daily habits or rituals, things that you do to help you keep and stay on your A-game. Thank you. I'm very much still a work in progress and feel like I'm just getting started. (laughs) Uh, And I'm I'm working on creating these habits and sticking with them. So um, one of them is before my feet hit the floor, when I wake up in the morning, I have a practice of expressing gratitude and Mm -hmm. reflecting. Um, Mm -hmm. So I'm thankful for my family. I'm thankful for a career that really matters to me and makes me feel like I'm making a contribution to the world. I'm thankful for having a roof over my head and the Mm -hmm. people in my life. Um, So I try to express gratitude. Um, I am working on exercise. I can't say I've quite perfected that one, but I'm trying for walking now. Uh, Mm -hmm. And my challenge there is when I do exercise, I like to go at it uh, for a while and building in the time for that is hard. So I'm trying to um, build in walks in a way Mm -hmm. that uh, even if I'm walking and talking or um, reflecting, whatever I need to be doing during that time to to actually go do it, Mm -hmm. build in the time to exercise. And then uh, I have really little kids. And um, for me, taking care of my own health is is important so I can be a great partner and parent for them. And um, eating 
well for me is a big deal. So I eat very healthfully. And that way, when I feel like I, I don't get around to exercise or the other ways that I might take care of myself, I feel mm-hmm. energized and healthy in what I'm putting into my body. I have not quite figured out how to go to sleep early or any <laughs> of the techniques that are suggested, but um, I'm doing better at, at taking care of myself physically and uh, emotionally and spiritually. That's great. And what I see is more of a holistic kind of, you know, you're looking at the entire kind of work life integration and making sure that you are balancing the two and not just, you know, at the end of the day, burning the candle at both ends or just focusing on one end or the other. So that balance is seems is what's what's helping you kind of just be successful in that way. Um, And I think you know, one of the things that you mentioned is more taking care of yourself physically so that you could give more. Yeah. And I think my idea of balance is basically if you have a tight rope, tight rope, staying on the tight rope, you know, some mm-hmm. days I might lean a little bit one direction or a little bit the other or take a few too many steps forward or back, but I stay on the tight rope. Mm-hmm. I also think, um, you know, if every day, everything I want to do to take care of myself doesn't happen, it's okay. You know, I look at it every couple days or three days. And, you know, if I'm generally over that time period doing what I think I should be doing to take care of myself, then I count that as a win. That's fantastic. Now, circling back a little bit, you you did mention how in terms of gaining those really great relationships, influential relationships, gaining the support and the buy-in from these very influential, you know, key people and getting their support in even financially backing your your mission. One of the important key things is you had to be able to tell that story. You had to really have that clarity on your purpose and your mission. Can you share with our audience, you know, what was the key for you or what were some of the things that helped you build or gain that clarity to tell that story so passionately? What was most helpful was that the medium is the message. Mm. So, my former boss and I became co-founders of this new organization, the Global Good Fund. Mm Mm-hmm. And when we stood in front of people to share our story, we just said, look at us, that the medium is the message. And I think people want to be part of something greater than themselves. Right. And if they can right. see themselves in me as an emerging social entrepreneur, or if they could see themselves in my co-founder as mm-hmm. a seasoned business executive who wants to dedicate their time to mentoring, we could create a platform to make that really easy for people. And I think that the main takeaway there was people want to be part of something greater than themselves. They want to live lives of purpose Mm -hmm. to contribute to the world and making it a better place. And if we can make that as easy as possible for people, they're way more apt to buy in and follow through. And so uh, telling a compelling story means embodying that story, embodying the mission, breathing the mission, Mm -hmm. uh, waking up and thinking about it, going to sleep and thinking about it. And uh, making it really easy for people to be part of, in our case, making the world a better place by supporting emerging social entrepreneurs. And so we went from, you know, when I started talking to folks about mentoring, it went from mentoring me to, would you communicate that you believe in another emerging entrepreneur by mm-hmm. mentoring that person and helping them accelerate their leadership and grow their social business? And because they could see what that had done for me, it Mm -hmm. made it a lot easier to communicate the message and what the potential could be for making a difference to other people. That's, that's absolutely fantastic. Tell me a little bit about, you know, because like you said, this, the role of mentorship or finding mentorships or connecting the mentors to those individuals who who need it, those underrepresented or marginalized groups. um, What are some patterns that you have seen in terms of, you know, in the, in that mentoring process, what are some of the biggest challenges um, that you, or, or kind of trends that you see that are holding these individuals back? One challenge is having a platform. Mm. And so I think some people are born with a platform. Uh, Other people don't have a platform and need to figure out how to get one. And what the Global Good Fund tries to do is is give people a platform so that their leadership can have a ripple effect Mm -hmm. across the country and world. And uh, it can be hard to learn how to ask someone to be a mentor if you've never had that experience before. And I think the the biggest misconception or myth is that... uh, 
you know, you're asking someone else to do you a favor by being a mentor. Mm. Well, the reality is it's really flattering to be asked to mentor. And so you're, ba- you're communicating that I really admire you and I want to learn from you. I want to emulate you. Um, and I think when, when you approach a potential mentor with that mindset, it's a very flattering conversation that mm-hmm. follows. Uh, and if you make it easy for that person to give back and make a difference in your life and in the world, again, why wouldn't they want mm-hmm. to do that? If, if you make it an efficient use of their time, if you come prepared, uh, if you're genuine in the way you engage, mm-hmm. they want to mentor. Uh, and the people who we've been able to connect with as mentors through the Global Good Fund repeat mentoring because it's such a meaningful experience mm-hmm. to good use of their time. And so I think those are the the misconceptions and the tips for how to engage mentors effectively. I want to dig a little deeper into, you said, you know, as a mentee, you know, you're asking this person to be a mentor, you're asking them for time and time is extremely valuable. And you said, Mm -hmm. come prepared. What does that mean for a mentee in terms of being an ideal mentee and really getting the most out of that mentoring relationship? Send your questions in advance, typed Mm -hmm. up, send them the questions in advance, uh, show up, you know, for every single meeting, there's no reason why you would ever be the one delaying a meeting or not showing up. Mm-hmm. Um, always go to them. So I think there's a, uh, an expectation that we'd meet in a mutually convenient location, and that's wrong. Mm-hmm. Uh, always go to wherever the mentor is. Make it easy for them to mm-hmm. make a difference. Uh, and then follow up expressing gratitude for what a meaningful conversation mm-hmm. that was. And, and to make it concrete, you could share a couple of key takeaways from the meeting and then plan the next meeting um, so that you make sure you have it lined up. Do you want to grow your impact as a change agent who ignites transformation in others, but you don't have a proven step-by-step method? Do you want to grow your visibility and influence as a thought leader to inspire others, but you don't know where to begin? The Beyond Barriers High Performance Executive Coach Certification is designed for experienced leaders who want to grow their impact and influence. Join this exclusive community of high achievers, advance your career as a leader, and experience the joy of helping others grow. Go to imbeyondbarriers.com and register for the webinar to learn more. That's really great advice. Now, digging a little into um, mentor relationships. A lot of the times, you know, me and working in, you know, diversity and inclusion and working with, you know, underrepresented groups, they'd always come to me saying, I can't find a mentor. I don't, you know, can't find a mentor because they're looking for mentors that look like them. And the reality, unfortunately, is is that sometimes there aren't a lot of mentors, you know, just representation or leadership that looks like them. What is your advice on, you know, you know, getting a mentor and kind of demystifying or debunking that myth that it, this person has to look like you to be a good mentor? I think it's a real challenge and um, that would be great if uh, everyone could see themselves in some way in their mentor. And I think, you know, we have a lot of work to do to Mm -hmm. to get to that point. Um, The reality is a lot of the people who have mentored me have not been the same sex, religion, from the same geography, you know, and there's a lot of differences Mm -hmm. there. And I think the reality is we share the same values. Mm. And as long as we share the same values, that mentoring relationship can be absolutely incredible Mm. because we care about the same things and what matters to us is mutual. In that situation, uh, there's a give-get that involves learning on both sides Mm. of the equation. And uh, those are the best mentoring relationships are when it's two-way. I do think it's okay to push for mentors who who look, sound, eat, pray like like mm-hmm. you, like me. Um, and where you can't find someone, it's a great opportunity to ask for a referral. Mm. Because I think a lot of times um, people would actually be interested in sharing their network for such a good cause if they were only asked. Right. Um, so asking, I think, is the, the most important thing and in, in really not necessarily 
limiting yourself or almost opting out of getting a mentoring relationships because you're only looking skin deep or you're only looking at the surface level. And so it's a whole, uh, you know, iceberg methodology, right? Like it's just the tip of the iceberg. If you look bef- below the water level, you probably are, you will have a lot of things in common with this individual that you just can't see. Yes. And sometimes there are people who have been in a different industry or have a different background or expertise that you might not think at face value is relevant to, to your work, mm-hmm. but gosh, it could be such an amazing opportunity to learn and apply the lessons that worked in a different industry to the industry mm-hmm. you're in. And I think the same thing can go for how, you know, my mentors have had to deal with different types of challenges, but the mm-hmm. lessons that you take away from navigating those experiences are directly applicable to my own life, even though we don't look the same. Mm-hmm. No, that's actually very insightful, um, you know, just guidance that you're providing. Now, thinking about um, just this current, you know, just day and age that we're in, right, this digital disruption, but also from, a, you know, just the disruption of COVID and all of these things where most of the time when people think of mentoring relationships, they think of meeting with someone in person, um, you know, having a coffee chat or lunch or whatever that might be. How has this new kind of virtual, you know, um, meeting setting um, impacted mentoring? You know, what is, what is your perspective on that? I'll first acknowledge that COVID has exacerbated some of the greatest issues of our time, and it's also created a meaningful call to action for companies to embrace more socially impactful ways of doing business. Mm -hmm. Uh, And to that effect, there's an opportunity for people who can and should mentor to get on board. Mm. Um, There's a, there's a, the doors open in ways that it may not have been earlier. Um, and there's really no excuse for not being able to have a conversation because it's all virtual. Um, I think it, it can be a little harder to get to those people because it's easy to ignore emails. Um, and so a few mm-hmm. techniques there um, would be to find out where a potential mentor is speaking or has written something uh, and listen or read, participate, and uh, follow up with them to say what a great you know, here's the key takeaway or what a great job you thought that was, or here's what you learned from that experience. Could we schedule 15 minutes to talk mm. and come prepare? Here are the questions I'd love to learn from you. Um, so I think acknowledging where you're seeing people um, being present and mm-hmm. what you're learning from those experiences is a good starting point. Um, I'm finding that there are a lot of people who still like to meet face to face and that can be you know, a challenge. Um, and for people who want to do a socially distanced outdoor gathering, that can be okay. But I'd say in general, COVID is actually uh, equaling the playing field in terms of access because mm-hmm. everyone's online right now. Right. And you, I have the opportunity the same way you do to reach out to anyone. Mm-hmm. That's a really interesting perspective. And it's so true now that, you know, there's, you know, leveraging technology to tap into these people and actually get mentored by someone who is now like proximity almost isn't is a non issue, right? Because it's like, let's just get on a zoom call and you can, you know, you can mentor me from, you know, across the country or across the world in that regard. Yes. So that's fantastic. Well, Thinking about, you know, the final question that we, you know, typically ask all of our listeners is, you know, thinking about women and accelerating their success. And especially in this age of, you know, just disruption of just continuous, you know, digital age, technology is always evolving. Um, What is your advice on having women stay ahead of the curve and continuing to accelerate their success? How can they continue to do that? I think the best way for any person, especially women, to accelerate their success is by investing in yourself, Mm. investing in themselves. And I think there's this um, unrealistic expectation that it's going to be other people who invest in me. Mm. And the reality is, if you're not investing in yourself, why should anyone else invest in you? Um, I learned this by uh, finding a women's governance training program that I really wanted to participate in because I thought there should be more women on boards. And it was expensive. Oof, this training program was expensive. And I really thought it was a great opportunity from an education standpoint for me. And I knew I couldn't foot the whole bill, but I could contribute, put some skin in the game. Mm-hmm. And so 
chairman of our board and said, I'm going to put in some money. Will you put in some money and invest in me in this way? And that was an example of how he saw that I put skin in the game. Mm. I invested in myself, not only with time, which a lot of people can do, but money and it hurt. <laughs> but I took it really seriously as a result. And when I went to classes, I shared with him how they went. When I eventually got put on a board, I thanked him. Mm. And as the you know, opportunities have grown from there, and as I've <clears throat> learned how to help place other women on boards, it's a gift he gave me that keeps on giving. And he may not have, while he's extremely generous, he was more apt to invest in me mm -hmm. because I first demonstrated that I was willing to invest in myself. And the same thing goes, you know, when I've tried to raise money for, for ventures, you know, if I need to put my own money in the game. It's not only time, it's money. And mm -hmm. it doesn't matter how much. You know, I lead a nonprofit organization, so I would know that it's, it's not about how much money you mm -hmm. personally put in the game, it's that you did. You put some skin in the game in addition to your time. You found opportunities that are development opportunities for yourself, and you put your time and money in, and other people are more apt to invest in, yourself, in you if you first invest in yourself. That is such sage advice. I mean, investing in yourself is probably the best investment you can make, right? Because you can really control that ROI on that investment. Yes. Um, but then it's also a level of accountability, right? We'd, like you said, when you're putting some skin in the game, it's going to hurt if you don't really follow yes. through and hold yourself yes, accountable. Yes, it does. I think that is fantastic advice. And um, something that I myself truly believe in, in terms of investing in yourself, because, well, first it has to start with you, right? And if you don't believe enough in yourself to invest in yourself, then how are you going to convince somebody else to invest in you? So exactly. that is fantastic. Thank you so much, Carrie, for taking the time on being on our podcast and sharing your fantastic insights and pearls of wisdom. Um, I know that our listeners are going to probably want to find out how they can get in contact with you just because of the wealth of advice and information and wisdom that you have shared. So what is the best way for our listeners to connect with you, follow you, and also join your mission and help you in, in um, pushing your mission forward? It as well. Well, we would love to engage with you, uh, especially in supporting other young leaders and especially people of color and women through the Global Good Fund, which is www.globalgoodfund.org. And I'd love to connect with you on social media, LinkedIn. Thank you again. It's been such a pleasure. Thank you for listening to the Beyond Barriers podcast. There are thousands of podcasts out there, and we are so grateful that you've chosen to listen to ours. If you enjoyed the show, please tell a friend about it and subscribe to get new episodes every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Visit imbeyondbarriers.com where you'll find show notes and links to all resources for each show, including the best way to connect with our guests. See you next episode.